Ladies and gentlemen, we'll now move to the next item of agenda, which is a motion in respect of a change to the rules of the club in respect of 50-year membership. So, ladies and gentlemen, as um, I think you'll appreciate from the materials that we've already sent out, this has been a very challenging and complex issue for your committee to deal with. It's got an extraordinary number of layers to it, um, made more complicated by the fact that um, the existing arrangements are obviously not currently in the rules of the club. And I wanted to start by outlining for you the history behind the current situation. I'll then go through the four points that we've proposed to be addressed in the rule changes, namely the recognition in the rules of the 50 year membership as a class of membership, inclusion of an initial cohort, specified cohort of female members into the class of 50 year membership, the creation of a 50 year social membership category and setting the fees for 50 year members going forward. We'll then move to questions and then we'll move to the vote on the motion. So, starting with the history, and uh, hopefully a slide will come up here, which gives you the minutes of the committee meeting of 12 July 1965, which set the subs for the upcoming season in pounds and dollars, given they were setting it for 1966, which was the first year of decimal currency. And you'll note the full subscription level was set at $20 for the year, a reduction from the $21 that was resolved at the committee meeting prior to this one. So um, they very generously changed their mind on the subscription. And that the 50 year membership category was resolved to be introduced um, with fees set at $15, being 75% of the then full subscription level. You'll note that it's noted that as that a, a recommendation of the Finance and Executive Committee read proposed changes in these, it, it, sorry, it is noted as a recommendation of the Finance and Executive Committee re-propose changes in the rules. Unfortunately, history shows us that the suggested rule change was never executed. Hence, the 50-year membership category was never created in the rules, but the $15 fee arrangement did commence for 50-year members. So, just thought I'd clarify that and uh, go right back to the source for you. So time has had its inevitable impact on this situation over the years. Inflation has moved this $15 fee from being a very substantial amount, 75% of a full subscription, to a token amount in today's dollars. People living longer has meant that the number of 50 year members has grown significantly and is projected to continue to do so in the future and I'll talk more about that later. And Unlike how we were in 1965, we're now a club that welcomes female members but have a legacy issue with females entering the 50-year membership club that does not sit well with modern community standards of fairness. Moving now to the different components of the rule change proposed to embed the 50-year membership arrangements in our rules. Firstly, proposed rule 6.5a to recognise the 50-year cohort as a membership category. I think this is uncontroversial and uh, it's correcting a historical oversight and doesn't require any further commentary from me. Secondly, proposed rule 6.5b to include an initial specified cohort of female members to the 50 year me member category. And members, I think a lot of you, you know, I hope all of you probably have a reasonable understanding of the history here and I'll just recap it briefly. Females could first join the waiting list in 1983. Those that did were first offered restricted membership in 1992. Some females became members from 1984 where they were nominated for membership by a full male member who relinquished his right to purchase an annual ladies or guest card. To have generous discounts for 50 year membership and have a generation of females miss out on this because they were not allowed to join the club does not sit well with modern community standards nor with our values as a member club. If we did nothing, we'll have a small group of female 50-year members join the category, category in 2034, but those that first joined the waiting list would not be eligible until 2042. Your committee sees this as an untenable situation, particularly in the context of making rule changes in 2022 to formally recognise the 50-year membership category more generally. Hence, we've set out criteria to enable those that moved reasonably quickly, i.e. within four years of first being able to either join the waiting list or accept the offer of a membership in exchange for a ladies or guest card, 
to move to 50-year member status in the membership year after they turn 65. Under the proposed rule, the initial cohort of women that will be offered this next year is 1,439, with an additional 1,377 women, females, assuming they continue their membership, to be offered this in subsequent years. In considering this proposal, we, your committee, were cognizant of the fact that these females will have paid, these females will have paid many years of membership dues, but will be short of paying 50 years of subscriptions. We do not believe this is a good reason to deny them 50 year membership. Indeed, at the extreme end, many of the 1,439 who immediately qualify will have only paid subscriptions for 30 years. They didn't pay subscriptions in the years before 1992 because they weren't allowed to. They would have loved the privilege of joining at a younger age and paying their subscriptions. They were denied this privilege due to discrimination. We're also cognizant that some of these females will become 50 year members earlier than their male counterparts of the same age. Particular focus at the moment um, on this was, this is of particular focus at the moment and a, a number of members have commented on, commented on this because in the last half of the 19, those put down on the waiting list in the last half of the 1950s and in the 1960s, the waiting list had blown out for them past 15 years. Indeed, for a couple of years, it was over 20 years. And that group is obviously now coming through to the cusp of 50-year membership if they were put down in birth at that time, i.e. the late 1950s or the 1960s. Um, that 15-year wait reverts back for the whole of the 1970s and the 1980s, and indeed is the norm in most of the club's history, albeit it then subsequently blew out many years later, but then um, redressed again at the t with the in in introduction of the, um, of the provisional membership. So this hiccup in the, in the late 50s and early 60s is a temporary situation. To put this in perspective of the 1,439 females who qualify the for the 50-year membership in the first year under these rules, 1,016 are already over 70 in any event. So the choice for us in dealing with this issue was whether to create a very complex rule to tr try to allow for wait periods in different years or to create a simple rule that by implication meant that some females move into the 50-year membership earlier than men of the same age. We chose the latter. We felt that the disadvantage these females suffered by being denied membership for so many years far outweighed the advantage some of them are receiving through getting access to the 50-year membership discount a little earlier than others. And I hope that gives you a fair and reasonable explanation for some of you that have asked questions about that particular issue. I now move to the third component proposed rule 5.6 to create the category of 50-year social membership. And hopefully this one is reasonably self-explanatory from the materials that we have provided. This is intended so that members who are unable to make it along to game days at the G, but still treasure their membership, want to continue to be part of the club, often are still able to tend, attend some social functions, including often 50-year member lunches, want to be able to nominate people to the waiting list, particularly grandchildren and great-grandchildren, so that they can continue their membership for the token $15 fee. Um, for the avoidance of any doubt, I note that this, given that this is a non-active membership category, once you have opted into it, you don't have the option to return to full membership. Committee intends that the subscription for this category will stay at $15, and we see no reason to change this in foreseeable future. We didn't write this into the rules because we've learnt it's not good practice to enshrine any fixed fee amount into a set of rules that's expected to last indefinitely and no good lawyer would suggest that you do this. Another issue that is not one for the formal rules is whether 50-year social members can get access to tickets to come to games occasionally. Your committee always intended that this would be the case, but again, we didn't think that this was something appropriate to write in the formal rules. Given the importance of this issue to older members who are considering moving to this category of membership, I'm happy to confirm that the committee have determined 
that 50-year members who change to 50-year social membership will be able to access up to four games a year, excluding Category 1 games, by purchasing entry tickets for themselves and one for a guest for each match. This will enable them to take a spouse, a carer or a family member or a friend with them. With the benefit of hindsight, we should have made this clearer when we put the announcements out and I do apologise for that. Finally now, I move to the last component of the 50-year member package proposed, the setting of 50-year member fees in accordance with Rule 12.2. I've already covered the history here and how the $15 fee has moved from being 75% of full subscriptions to being an amount that's token in the context of contemporary costs and managing our club. The two other key factors which led the committee to the conclusion that material change is required in respect of this fee, and I want to outline those now. The first is our expectation that the cohort of 50-year members will grow very significantly in the medium term. And by way of background, um, I can tell you that for many years now, the clubs is enga have engaged independent expert actuaries, Taylor Fry, to help us with modelling future membership numbers, projected wait times between categories of members, etc. At the time of our membership review in 2019, these models were updated and the updated numbers did inform our thinking around the expected growth in numbers of 50-year members. I would add that this model is, um, is one that the clubs used for a long time with clear, stable assumptions based on the actuary's interpretation of our membership experience over time and the actuary's expertise on mortality trends. The current 50-year member cohort is 4,051. The model shows this number staying reasonably stable for the next 10 years, then growing in an accelerating fashion, hitting 20,000 50-year members in 30 years' time. In considering this, bearing in mind that the 50-year journey starts when you become any sort of member. There's been some misunderstandings there. Some people have thought it only starts when you become a full member. That's not the case. It's when you become any sort of member, your time starts ticking for your 50 years. And while many in this room who were put down in the waiting list in the 1950s and 60s took more than 15 years to become members, as I mentioned earlier, those put down in the 70s and the 80s all took only 15 years. So as, the cohort, as this latter cohort moves to 50-year membership over the next generation, average age of a new 50-year member will drop, which has a very significant impact on the size of the cohort over time. I give that by way of explanation because some people have said, you know, I don't really understand how the, the category is going to grow so much. So I hope that helps you in, in understanding that. The next issue we looked at that I wanted to highlight is the direct cost to the clubs of a mem a members attending event days. We've not talked about this a lot with members as our arrangements with Cricket Australia and the AFL are subject to very strict confidentiality agreements. But as part of this process, I have obtained permission from Cricket Australia and the AFL to make some broad comments on this. And I can confirm that we run a direct payment model to the AFL and CA for each member that comes to an event. For example, if a member attends two AFL home and away matches, the AFL grand final and day one of the Boxing Day test, the payments to AFL and Cricket Australia for that member attending those events is over $400. Similarly, if a member attends days one to three of the Boxing Day test, two other finals, two finals excluding the grand final and a couple of home and away matches, again, the payment is over $400. We also looked at um, the level of attendance of, at events by 50-year members. We found that the percentage of members in a given year that do not attend any events at all is 15% higher for 50-year members when compared to the general membership. We believe this 15% represents a group that have kept their membership going because it's only $15, even though they may be unable due to age or health to attend events. We expect this to be the group generally, that will move to the 50-year social membership category. When you eliminate this 15%, the average number of games attended by 50-year members is almost exactly the same as for all membership categories and is around only half a game lower than the average attendance of all full members. In summary, from these three points, we noted the number of members in the 50-year category will blow out significantly in the medium term. 50-year members are very active participants in events at the G. 
And unlike some clubs, such as golf clubs and city social clubs, we have a very substantial direct cost when our members utilise their membership. This leads us to the inescapable conclusion that the $15 fee is not sustainable in the long term. It's not that we can't afford it now, but as the 50-year member cohort grows, it will become a financial burden on the club. Knowing that we can change things now, it would be irresponsible to leave this burden in place for the next generation to deal with. Also, keeping the $15 token subscription going now when future generations of members will not be able to benefit from it is just plainly unfair. We then set about determining a fee level for 50-year members that does appropriately reward their loyalty to the club, is affordable, and at the same time is at a level that we believe will be sustainable as the 50-year membership cohort grows, so we don't face this issue again in the next 10 or 20 years or whenever. We landed on a 50% discount, with the added benefit of phasing this in gradually over the next five years. In today's dollars, this results in an average annual 50-year full, full member fee over the next five years of $183. Appropriate further reductions apply for regional, interstate and overseas members, of course. When we do move to the 50% discount in five years' time, it's interesting to note that this uh, discount will be double that given by our forefathers when they first introduced the discount in 1965. The phasing in allows, allows those in more difficult financial circumstances time to adjust. Again, in current dollars, 50% of a full subscription is $15 a fortnight. We compared this to the single person pension to ensure affordability. This pension is currently $987 per fortnight. We considered grandfathering, but we could not reconcile this as an approach from a fairness perspective to all members particularly given the very significant and direct costs associated with our members attending events at the G. Members, before I conclude, there are two further points I would like to make. Some members in phone calls with me, and I'm told by others on social media platforms as well, have described this as a money grab and accused us of being greedy. I did cover this in my, the video, but I wanted to re reiterate my thoughts tonight. And the starting point here is to remind you that myself and your committee are volunteers. We are not paid. We do not receive bonuses. We are in absolutely no way incentivised to put finances of the club ahead of the interests of members. When we set KPIs for management around membership issues, the absolute primary driver is membership satisfaction and membership services. When we're dealing with the rest of the ground, which we run on behalf of the government, obviously the situation is somewhat different. Obviously we try to maximise revenue out of corporate suites and, and everything out that's out there. So if I'm sounding a little heated under the collar on this one, is because it is, to be, to be frank, it's, it's, it's really objectionable for me to hear those things, never to my face, but obviously, um, you know, behind my back because that's just not how we operate. And why would we operate that way? What, why on earth would we be interested in any way, shape or form to not act in the best interests of members um, rather than build up some war chest in a non-profit organisation? Now, we do want to keep a healthy balance sheet. That is hugely important. Um, as I've mentioned when we talked about the COVID discounts, um, we have to keep this club in a strong financial position so that we t maintain our management rights of the MCG. If we don't do that, then everything we do for members and our rights to the membership area in this ground get call gets called into question. So yes, we do have to keep a strong balance sheet. But what we are dealing with here is primarily, primarily an issue of fairness. Um, it's not about trying to uh, enhance the balance sheet today. So I've got that off my chest. Another issue which has been reasonably raised is why is all of this in one motion, motion one motion rather than multiple motions? Um, and, you know, I need to remind you that there is nothing in the club rules about 50-year membership at the moment. Our job as your committee is to put forward proposed rules. We don't believe these stand alone in single motions. We can't introduce the category into the rules without setting the fee for the category. 
We don't believe that in 2020 it's appropriate to recognise the category and the rules without tackling the gender issue. Hence, we have not separated this as, a, as, as multiple motions. It wouldn't make sense in our view. Finally, the 50-year social membership category is clearly complementary to the rest of the package. And I'll remind members that when we brought in the provisional membership category, that was done as one motion. This is a, a set of rules um, you know, that comes into the membership, uh, all relating to the one broad topic, the 50-year member, and we believe that it is a package. So members, in conclusion, before I turn to questions, I ask that you cast your vote as responsible members of this great club looking at the big picture from the perspective of the long-term future of the club for all members. Please put your own personal circumstances into this broader context. We currently have nothing in place in our club rules for 50-year members. It's a fair and reasonable, is this a fair and reasonable package having regard to all members crossing multiple generations? Your committee firmly believes that it is. So thank you very much for listening to me.